feature presentation. Welcome back to another Untitled Movie Review. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck, alongside. He's allergic to tomatoes, but he is tomato meter approved, Eric Marchin. Matt, I am really excited to talk about this one. Uh, not only because it's going to be a fun review, I feel, but also we have a guest with us, which, uh, you know, is, is, is rare these days. We, we tend to have guests on the show from time to time if we're doing interviews, but for reviews or the regular shows, it's usually just the two of us, but it's nice to invite uh, a third party into the, the equation. Yes, our guest today, you might know him as Eric's brother. <laughs> Kyle March. I think you forgot the main thing, Garlic Jr. enthusiast. <laughs> yeah. No, filmmaker Kyle March, and how are you? I'm good. Yeah, that's the original moniker, Eric's brother. No, he's well? he's much more than that. He's actually ten times more talented. Talent, more talented than, me. than either of us. Um, he makes oh stuff. We just talk God. about it. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, come on. And he actually knows something about film, so you know. Uh, Kyle's been on the show before, so yeah. you guys know him, and. Uh, uh, I'm excited to talk about this movie with both of you guys because we all saw it. Not t- technically together. We were in the same theater. I went with my wife, Nevis. You guys saw the movie together. Uh, but today we are reviewing Jordan Peele's Nope, starring Daniel Kaluuya, uh, Kiki Palmer, Stephen Yun, uh, and more. Oh, Michael Wincott. I can't not say Michael Wincott because Eric to. will yell at me. You have to. Um, uh, but a great cast. Uh, Keith David's in there. Uh Oz Perkins shows up who Brandon uh, Perea, 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 um, Brandon Perea, Perea, who used, this yeah. is great. This is a little quick side tangent. So I was trying Wouldn't to pronounce his way. name. Um, so I was watching an interview with him. Very, very charming guy started out as a break dance roller skater and then got hired um, as an actor or cast in the, the OA, which is a Netflix show. So yep. good for him. Reminds me a lot of Dave Franco, weirdly. Dude, I thought the yeah. exact same thing watching it. His <laughs> mannerisms were very similar. And I was totally. like, man, this guy reminds me of Dave Franco. So I'm glad you said that. Um, I guess let's get right into it. So uh, the movie is out now for all of you guys. So what we're going to do is what we did with Thor. Get and some out. Other things and, it's out now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to do spoiler free for the first couple minutes. We'll just kind of go through and give you our overall thoughts on the movie and whether you guys should go check it out. And then I'll give you guys a spoiler countdown. And if you've seen the movie, uh, you can stick with us. And we're going to kind of go full into spoilers because this movie is hard-ish to talk about without kind of going into plot details and things like that. I know they've been pretty secretive of what the movie's about, although I did go see the newest. I watched the final trailer after we watched the movie, and it gives away way too much, which I did not. I'm glad I didn't watch before this. So if you've seen that, you might be okay. But uh, anyway, stick around if you've seen the movie. If not, go watch the movie. Come back. Uh, but let's kick it off. Uh, Kyle, I'll start with you, man, Like since you are our guest. Uh, what do you think of Jordan Peele's Nope? Uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, I had a, I had a blast. Um, I, I thought it was, yeah, I, I don't know. I left the theater and I, I was on a high. It felt like we've kind of been spoiled with two really good summer blockbuster, um, like return to cinema kind of style movies with, uh, Top Gun Maverick earlier this year. And now, uh, I almost said up, uh, now nope feeling, um, again kind of in that same vein where uh this is a definitely a movie i think that you want to see in a theater and uh again i'm trying not to say too much but uh, (laughs) i think i think it's one of the most fun big you know horror sci-fi blockbusters i can remember seeing um and like you talked about i think the cast you know um works really well um I, i think the you know Peel's vision is very clear. I, for me personally, I feel like this is a bit more of a return to form um, after Us. Um, I, I, I don't think Us is a bad movie, but this just feels a lot more uh, honed in and, and uh, in a weird way, bigger, but uh, also more concise. Um, and yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Cool. Eric. 
Yeah, I, I think to kind of echo Kyle's thoughts, I think it's so well constructed and the narrative structure has so many great payoffs and setups that are sort of integrated in a way early on that feel very organic and natural and not kind of like tipping its own hat, so to speak, where it's like, haha, it's like, you know, we, we were setting this up right away. It does it where it, it impresses and surprises you uh, in, in certain manners. And, and one thing that I really did love about this movie was what it ultimately becomes. I think like not knowing too much going into it other than seeing the trailers is to expect the unexpected and the way that Jordan Peele both pays tribute to films that he loves and, and the genre itself, you know, this is a blockbuster spectacle first and foremost. And if you're watching this in IMAX or just on a big screen in general, I think it's, such an immersive experience that when you're kind of in the world that Peel has created, you really do appreciate that not a lot of horror and sci-fi movies get this kind of treatment unless you are getting a, a populist a tour filmmaker directing it, someone like a James Cameron. Like, nope to me, I mean, we all three of us have only watched it once, but nope to me already feels like a film that I could re-watch on multiple occasions in the same way that I do James Cameron's Aliens. It's like one of those movies that I'm still thinking of certain scenes and certain sound design and certain choices that Peel made that I think in any other director's hands could have just been kind of a conventional exercise in genre filmmaking where this Peel is having fun, but there's an interesting point being made or there's there's underlining humor that is very dark but also very pointed at certain aspects of the film industry and i think that this movie really highlights those aspects so if you love horror movies or sci-fi films if you love kind of those big event movies in general this is something that you will definitely enjoy if you're looking for another get out or even us you might be a little bit more disappointed because it's not necessarily a social commentary first and foremost. I think that's in there, but yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say it's definitely more of a straightforward kind of uh, adventure sci-fi movie. Like I, I, I compared it to Spielberg. I'm sure people will, will go into that more when we talk about details, but like uh, I'm just, I think this solidifies that like no matter what Jordan Peele makes in the future, like I, I was already kind of signed up on day one because get out was so good. But like what Kyle said, like I thought there wasn't anything like us wasn't bad. I just found us a little disappointing where I, I was like, I didn't I haven't rewatched it. And I would love to now go back and kind of go through Get Out Us and this back to back to back. But uh, yeah, I'm just kind of echoing what both of you guys said. Like, I think the IMAX footage in this movie is absolutely stunning and incredible. Um, the way that Jordan Peele kind of. Uh, the blocking and, and of the whole thing and just using that IMAX cinematography in a way that feels completely different than what Nolan does and what other people have used that format for. Um, I thought that was perfect. Um, I just thought it was like a really, really thoroughly entertaining kind of throwback summer blockbuster. Cause like, I feel like, and Top Gun was in a similar way, right? Where Top Gun uh, perfectly utilized kind of that legacy sequel uh, kind of, type of movie we've been getting over and over again and, and did that perfectly. And to Kyle's point again, like that was a reason to go back to the movies and see that in IMAX as well. And this, I just felt like it felt like an eighties or nineties kind of sci-fi movie to me throughout the whole thing, everything from the music to how it's shot to how the, whatever they're going <laughs> is attacking them. I don't want to go. Sorry. I'm trying to dance around things, but I thought it had great horror elements. The music was there comedy was there that social commentary was there um and i like that he kind of just played it straight and and said i'm just gonna make like a really fun big spectacle and i think that's just really really cool and i don't think it needed to be anything more than that and uh, i think if you do go in hoping for get out again sure yeah you might not get that uh but i think if you go in expecting kind of an 80s 90s throwback kind of sci-fi movie slow burn for the first hour or so but the pacing i think was super engaging throughout the entire thing where i never felt bored or anything even though it was slower it's like i connected with the characters i was intrigued by the mystery um 
going back to like again the IMAX footage how it's utilized like it does have that Chris Nolan kind of snap back between 239 and fucking gigantic IMAX which can be distracting to some people but I think it's utilized in a really kind of smart way and, and I think the sequences he chose to show in IMAX were um were perfect and you know one that was kind of surprising to shoot in IMAX and the rest of it being like totally made sense to shoot in IMAX. And I just think that uh, kind of back and forth really, really worked. But uh, I'll shut up now so we can go into spoilers. But I think all three of us are on the same page. Like, I think it is an absolute kind of must-see. If you have a full-frame laser IMAX theater near you, I think that is... And I know that I said the same thing for our Lightyear review. And um, I'll say it probably for anyone who actually, you know, either frames their movie, like in Lightyear's case, or in in live action stuff actually shoot stuff on IMAX film uh it's the absolute way you should go see this movie if you can like if you it's worth driving the hour to go see it's worth taking transit for an hour and a half to go see if you have one of those theaters that are in like a a bigger city near you i mean i think you'll still have a really great time if you just go see this at a regular screen or a drive-in is something we we talked about uh, after we got out i think it's a fantastic drive-in movie um but if you can go see it in imax it is uh it is fantastic uh eric did we want to give scores before we go into spoilers like, yeah i think we should just so I- yeah. if anybody is listening or watching this that wants to go and see the movie and not be spoiled please don't please you know go see the movie yeah. don't don't spoil yourself this is a movie that's worth having those reveals you know slowly kind of come to life in in the film so yeah i think we should probably do the rating yeah first. i'm i'm gonna give it a four to five i think i could even go higher to a four 4.5 like i've been the more I, I i've slept on it a night and i think even when i talked to you guys last night i had some criticisms with kind of how i felt about the last act and it's not like it didn't stick the landing or anything or if it, it didn't leave a sour taste in my mouth or anything i just had like a few problems with that final act but as i've kind of slept on it i'm those are kind of drifting away and i'm just thinking about how much i enjoyed the shit out of the movie and uh i actually can't wait to see it again so i think my i'm gonna stick with my four out of five i still think it's one of the best movies of the year um uh but that could easily be a 4.5 or even higher on on a rewatch so that's what i'm gonna go with uh we can go in reverse order eric go ahead yeah yeah so uh i'm going to put a four out of five on it i'm not going to put a five on it just yet because i also want to rewatch it sorry i can't help myself with the puns um but it is it it is (laughs) i do i do i'm going to therapy for it um but it is a movie that is so much fun and it reminded me that you can have fun watching a movie like this and just enjoy yourself and you know part of the fun was watching it in a IMAX theater but another part of it was also watching it with Kyle um I I just really felt that it was um truly uh, a really wonderful experience and I'm very grateful to Jordan Peele for making this movie because of those reasons cool Kyle I'm I'm a little bit ratings averse just because I I, I stopped giving movies ratings. Even you don't have to. You can abstain. You can give it a like, well, a heart. Yeah, a thumb, so I think that's what I, that's what I might do. But I feel like again, you know, um, I feel like that feels right. Like I, a four, you know, somewhere in between a four and a four and a half, or 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 a heart, and, uh, you know, on Letterbox. I yeah, I, I thought it was yeah. I really again like I just enjoyed it a lot and. I'd be interested to go back and rewatch it. Cause I think the thing that Jordan Peele does really well is, um, and we were talking about this even after the screening, what we did pick up on. Um, he really, I think is good at making a film that pays off on multiple levels after an initial kind of, uh, you know, euphoria of watching, you know, that, that excitement and that, um, you know, you leave the theater feeling really hyped up about seeing something like, especially like Nope, which uh, again is his biggest and almost mo- mo- most, you know, blockbuster esque kind of style film. Uh, but I feel like he still did such a good job at weaving in a lot of, you know, great character moments, great foreshadowing, um, you know, visual foreshadowing, which we were picking up on. Um, and it felt like nothing was wasted, which I just really appreciated. Like he, 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 I think he spent a lot of time cooking this one, which uh, I really, 
really appreciated while watching, just like looking at every scene and kind of, you know, reading on nice. stuff. Yeah. So absolutely go see it uh, if you haven't. And uh, if you have seen it, stick around because we're about to get into spoilers in five, four, three, two, one. Bruce Willis All right. dies. It's a giant. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's a good M Night reference because I know because I mean, it reminds you it so just... much of Signs, and yeah. and that's the kind of feeling I had watching this movie before we go into spoilers. That, I fucking like... love Signs. We're in spoiler mode. <laughs> yeah, we're in yeah. spoiler mode. Spoiler. So. Signs is a good movie. <laughs> um, yeah. it, but it had that feeling. I mean, not only because you know it's quote unquote an alien invasion movie, but like that, you know, Signs. I think was late July, early August. That kind of mm-hmm. late summer kind of movie where you're maybe not expecting you know that kind of like early summer release but it still surprises you in some ways and there's that tension and atmosphere that's built so well into the film um but i think the thing that all three of us want to kind of spoil first i mean i'm only speaking for myself here is that it's a creature feature which i didn't yeah. realize that it was a no creature neither did feature. i yeah it's it's yeah. a monster movie yeah like which is the awesome. best, like, the best version of one one on a scale that i don't think we've seen in a very very long time yeah we we brought up that it reminded us of of kaiju it reminded us of of me of uh you know people compared it to jaws and jurassic park bringing up the spielberg comparisons i mean m night is a perfect comparison as well people compared him to spielberg as well but close encounters obviously like close encounters meet jaws is like the closest thing to kind of say like it, from movies that he's not necessarily taking from but um inspired by but like it yeah i i had no idea it was a creature feature it was a monster movie and um that was such a pleasant surprise and i feel like there's so much good uh kind of uh, there's so many red herrings throughout the movie like i love the sequence with the alien children like that are just <laughs> yeah uh that like it was so perfect and then you brought up uh kyle there's a scene where a grasshopper goes over a security camera yeah the praying mantis, the praying mantis like, yeah. or yeah sorry praying mantis thank and you and it follows um, that scene and so the shape of the masks that the kids are wearing yeah or kind of looks, that classic alien, yeah. kind of big eyed, kind of big almost head. Almost like thing. an upside down tri- like guitar pick kind of look. Yep. And then right, yeah. the um that was one of those shots where you could like we're gonna try to explain it here, but until you see the movie or until you see the visual, um, you don't appreciate it. And I feel like that was definitely again what I was talking about before with Jordan Peele. I feel like he has these these ideas that, you know, don't work in any other medium, right? So and those moments are so great because I feel like up until that moment, you still have no idea what the fuck is happening in this movie. And you just assume that it is going to be like signs or something like that, where um, it is going to be aliens invading and there'll be these creatures that are on the ground kind of thing. But instead you have this kind of space mantis or, or whatever you want to call it. Well, I mean, it's, it, it, up, it like, is, it's, it is a flying saucer in design. And I, I think that that's even interesting in ter- terms of just it's, conceit where you know the idea of over the 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 centuries and and you know ufo reportings in general like a flying saucer abducting people well what happens if the saucer was the alien and like it doesn't really have any sort of uh, external features which also is kind of clever because you would think that like oh if it had eyes or anything on the outside it would probably burn up coming into the atmosphere so i think like that is interesting in that all of its anatomy, its internal anatomy is on the inside, like, you know, a, a, an octopus or a cuttlefish, the way that it kind of catches its prey and the beak is underneath its body. Mm-hmm. And I just yeah. think that's just such a cool concept that isn't really revealed until about, you know, halfway through or three. Or but again, it's, act, it's, but, it's broadcasted um, throughout the entire first hour, you know, the idea of all these different, um, scenes and motifs that are built around like animal wranglers and the idea of you know whether it be a horse or a chimpanzee or you know any of these things and it's and then you cross this threshold of again and i think daniel kaluuya says it in the film he's just like what if it's not a ship right so i'll just say as well i think it also has moments where it makes you fear the creature again because ufos like zombies like any monster have been done so many times so there's a ton of tropes and cliches that come with that and so when we see 
that big reveal of how it works, you know, when it sucks up Steven Yoon's, you know, child actor turned sort of opportunistic MC and all the people that are watching it, the viewers. That scene I have nightmares about. It is yeah. so yeah. disturbing and claustrophobic yeah. and gross oh. in terms of it's like, like it, that's where it reminds me so much of like an eighties movie where like yeah. the, the practical effects of the, of the digestive yep. system of this thing is so disturbing. I think the it's last so time disturbing. I saw something like that was like an anaconda when John Boyd gets eaten and you see the insides <laughs> of it, or you, when Tommy Lee Jones gets eaten by the, the giant cockroach. Yeah. And, and that's what it reminded me of. Yeah. That's what it reminded me of, but it's the really just twisted version version of that and yeah yeah it was funny i don't know if that's what you're referencing matt with like scenes that were surprisingly shot on imax but the fact that because that was shot on imax yeah, that was that IMAX was, film, yeah, and, yeah and it shooting such a contained claustrophobic scene on such a large format and it was so simple like it was all just like practical simplistic yeah like the whole shot was just simple, an esophagus it, basically yeah or... but it was oh i like i hated it i that scene yeah. was my even more than the, the the chimpanzee stuff, I was I was I was very very uncomfortable during. I mean that yeah. even that that's a good point too. Of like that was the other thing I was referencing of being surprising that that was in IMAX as well, mm -hmm. right? Because like again the the IMAX format is I sound like I like work for IMAX every time I talk about it, but like I just I I really think that there's nothing like it. Like I I said that to Eric I think when we were walking back to Union of being like, um, it, it's that one format that i really go you can't get this experience at home like you can no. imitate basically you know if i watch a movie in you know 239 or or basically 185 it'll fill up my tv and my sound system is good and like i'll get a pretty okay ex like pretty good experience at home and depending on your level of income and in your home theater you have you can almost imitate what you get at the movies now um but there's something about one of those giant imax screens that is just so overwhelming whenever it cuts to the IMAX footage and whether it is that whole sequence with uh, Gordy as, as the chimp, which seems like interesting that they shot that in IMAX or the scene, like you were talking about Kyle of everyone getting sucked up and it's claustrophobic, but the height of the screen and just the overwhelmingness of it, it puts you like right inside with those people. And then the sound design with everyone screaming, which they use throughout the whole movie is like almost the aliens like call when it's like not call, but it's right after it's like, it weaponizes people. Them. Yeah. Yeah. It, I thought that was really cool the way it weaponizes the screams. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways. Yeah. And I, and then going back to the IMAX cinematography, what I was referencing before, he's like the blocking and the framing of everything I thought was cool because everyone's looking up into the, the sky throughout the whole thing at this uh, at this creature right so it's please just the please way that it's creature framed. is his father's name um, jean jacket is <laughs> sorry at jean jacket and uh it's just the way that it's framed you're almost doing the same thing as you're sitting in this theater right because like everyone's framed very low in the shot and a lot of it's of the sky and it's following this thing as it kind of zips and zags throughout like very smoothly throughout the sky and i just thought that stuff was just um fantastic there is a great sequence as well um, like the movie kind of does that jarring cut back and forth between IMAX footage and it doesn't kind of like smoothly go into the uh, IMAX footage except for one sequence that is like one of the, the main set pieces in the movie in the third act when I think Kiki Palmer goes to look out a window and then as it follows her out the window it yep. opens up into the IMAX aspect ratio and that's just I'm a sucker for that um i'm a sucker for chapter titles too which usually doesn't always work but like uh, and i don't know if it was completely necessary with the horse it, names but it was a cool convention though instead of just doing arbitrary chapter titles like, yeah it, like having them built in, th that's the thing that i again I, I just really loved about this film is it felt like you know for a two hour and 15 minute runtime there was very little fat on the bone like yeah. every scene and sequence did something important and uh was again just just establish something like um the opening of the film with um uh Gordy? keith david uh, oh, no, yeah, no 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 sorry, sorry yeah after that with with keith david and stuff and then um and i brought it up last la or the other night when we saw it after we uh, left the the theater but like even even that whole sequence you know holds for a few moments longer as like an emotional beat and then you see his hat floating by and the way it angles up and the visual representation of it in the uh, Jordan Peele's composition is um, 
it literally foreshadows the the coming events, right? It foreshadows what killed the father, right? It, mm-hmm, it's shaped mm-hmm. and floats exactly like yeah. Jean Jacket. Exactly, it's shaped yeah. and looks and resembles, and and that whole payoff, like that alone. Thinking back to it, I'm like, that's I don't know that that's where I think the genius comes in, where this doesn't just feel like a standard blockbuster. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of ingenuity here, but I also think there's a lot of amazing storytelling. And I think um, the other thing that I, yeah, they, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm a huge fan of the fact that Jordan Peele was able to make a entertaining, huge blockbuster. Um, one that was also very disturbing at times, uh, yeah. which is hard to do, you know, we're all pretty desensitized, but also the fact that uh, he was able to convey a lot of really um, in, ingenious kind of imagery And then on top of that, have a social commentary woven in without it being uh, necessarily at the forefront, right? And I thought all of those things to seamlessly kind of put them together. I'm sure a lot of people won't be as ecstatic or think it's as seamless. But to me, I was just, I I, I don't know. That's why you go to the movies. It's very Um, appealing. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. Rambling aside, it's just a great. You're not rambling. That's what we do on this show. So you can ramble for two hours. But that is a great point, though. And that's like the the insight, like, you know, from a filmmaker point of view, like those things that could be easily missed the first time you watch it. Because I think when you're watching something like this the first time around, you're always trying to anticipate what the twist is going to be or what the surprise is going to be, or how does this all kind of come together and not enjoying just the compositions of the framing or the symbolism or even like the thing that I keep thinking about that I wasn't thinking about while watching it. But I think one of the best comedic elements, that's very subtle, but also very funny is that you have Daniel Kaluuya, who is just so incredible in this movie. Yeah. I mean, obviously he's great in, in everything he does, but there's just something about, you know, the stillness of his performance. But what I love about his uh, his character, OJ, not just his name, OJ, which is referenced in amusing ways throughout the film, but it's the way that this character, after, you know, losing his father and, you know, the six months that kind of jump by and that we're told that he's kind of been taking on the business for himself as, you know, the Hayward uh, Hollywood uh, horses and and the ranch is that even though all these like horrific things are, are, are happening around him, he's still tending to the farm. He's still getting up at like five in the morning and feeding the horses and there's work to be done. It doesn't matter that there could be this alien invasion happening around him. It's like, I still got to do work. I still have to be a a farmer, a rancher. Like these, this job isn't going to do itself. And I weirdly think that that's funny because I think in any other movie, you know, this event would basically, you know, pause everything else that's going on in a character's life. And I think that that is very funny, but also kind of truthful in what, you know, I mean, Kyle and I have a a, a father and, and, and a stepmother who, you know, tend to a farm and they're up at like 5 a.m. in the morning and, you know, doing chores. And then they're doing chores again at like 6 or 7 p.m. at night. And it's just like, yeah, it takes a lot to run a farm. And just because there's this alien creature terrorizing That's people doesn't mean I'm going to stop. Cloud. And that, yeah. that is funny to me anyways. Well, I think even the treatment, like even him going about his life or you have Steven Yun's character who's kind of taking advantage of this creature and using it for his own kind of, you know, gain and he's sacrificing horses to it. And I think there's something there with the what happens to him with Gordy and, and you know, and, and how the movie tackles. Kyle made a, a good point, like it tackles Hollywood, it tackles animals and it tackles like other stuff throughout, too, that I think like it doesn't necessarily like maybe have anything like super deep to say. And I don't mean that as an insulting thing, but I just think it's interesting that it's touching on all of these different things in an entertainment or like an entertaining summer blockbuster. Cause you don't get that a lot of times in like a popcorn movie or something like mm-hmm. that, which this could be considered as. So like, I think even with the, the, you know, opening the movie with that Gordy sequence, right. And then like going back to it halfway through and showing you, what happened on uh, on the Gordy's home sitcom and like uh, how that plays out with Steven Yun's character and the shoe that's standing up on, um, with the blood spot and then how Steven Yun kind of takes advantage of that. And if that's, I don't know, it's a movie that I can't wait to see again, like you said, and kind of go into more of yeah. that stuff. Cause at first I think 
to your point, Kyle, you're just kind of watching it. And I think like on rewatches, you might dive more into the commentary or the other things like that well i wanted to ask i wanted to ask you guys that question because like i've been thinking about that opening sequence and when we do get back to it later on one i think you know having that imac shot kind of immersive in 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 that nature in in 1998 and seeing craft services uh, was kind of comical but but starting with with that attack and then coming back to it i could see a lot of people criticizing like well why is this even in the movie or does it even belong in the film but i think it's an important aspect to the the story that peel is telling and especially to the point of animal cruelty and sort of how you can't control nature even if you think you can you can't control an animal an animal you know no matter how much training goes on it doesn't it's still an animal you know you have to be respectful of that the other thing too though is i mean I don't know, like it's such a huge component to Stephen Young's character, right? And I don't think you get a full flushed out vision of this movie without all of the the Gordy sequences. And I I think those are going to be the ones that are going to upset people the most because they are tough to watch. Um, But I I also, to me, I I think, I don't know, I didn't, I personally didn't leave that movie thinking like, those didn't need to be in there. I, I think they're extremely important. And I think um, having that scene, especially right off the top, really does set a certain tone, right? And it all plays into, again, that universal theme, of, like you were talking about, Eric, and, and you, Matt, too. It's like, you, you know, controlling nature and, and you know, animal cruelty and um, on a very surface level. But I also think there's just something to be said about, um, you know, and Daniel Kaluuya's character has that line about um, not staring a predator in the eye right and um you know that comes into play that's just pure plot like even removing all of the subtext and all of that and it comes into yeah. play and it's foreshadowed through all of the gordy stuff through the sequence with uh the commercial shoot which i also we haven't talked about it but like even having that being the first time you meet daniel kaluuya's character and his stoicism immediately is present and then having that lead into, you know, the siblings uh, when Kiki Palmer shows up and their relationship, the two of them balance each other out perfectly. Yeah. I thought the two of them are like, both of them. I was just, I, I, they were a ton of fun. They, they were emotionally resonant. I, I like, I was fully invested in both of them within the first uh, five minutes of them being on screen. Um, but that being said, like, you know, uh, Matt to throw a wrestling term at you, there were no jobbers in the cast. Like, no, you know, I don't think there was it. like yeah. everybody, like there wasn't a, a, a performance of the main, you know, key cast, which is actually kind of quite small and contained. If you think about the, a movie that uh, usually on this scale, which is another reason why I think it feels a little bit different than a standard blockbuster, but you know, you have Daniel Kaluuya, Kiki Palmer, Steven Yeun, um, Michael Wincott. Uh, Michael, Michael Wincott. Wincott. Right. Yeah. No, 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 no. I was trying to remember if it was, uh, and then yeah, Keith David is the dad. Um, yeah. And Brandon Preo. I, I guess, and yeah. Brandon Preo is Angel. And it's like, that's your key cast. You know, I know yeah. there are other people, um, but all of them deliver. All of them have their moments. And I think, um, I don't know. It's, I think it's a credit to Peel to be able to make each character in a film like this feel real, uh, feel flushed out and, yeah just enjoyable as well especially when you emotionally invest like like even a guy like angel in this film which is kind of like you know a bit of a comedic relief at times i was emotionally invested you know yeah he just broke up man with his girlfriend yeah yeah gotta have a heart (laughs) he was great he was really good we'll get into michael wincott in a second too but but what did you Um, but but matt what did you think about the the gordy scenes in terms of how they play into the film i was exactly with you i went to the animal cruelty angle and you can't control like animal kind of instinct or just kind of uh, you can't mistreat animals like that or take or kind of use them for you know whether it's a commentary on hollywood and the treatment of animals or just treatment of animals in general like uh, and using them as spectacle and using them as you know essentially that's what steven yun does with the alien creature later too right and he doesn't learn from that experience he actually kind of uses a tragedy to kind of keep relevant right to capitalize <laughs> like, he, he, to capitalize he, yeah. on it and i think that's kind of interesting and i so i do think that it's absolutely you know worth keeping in the like again it does feel at first you're like what the hell does this have anything to do with with what's happening in this movie and i can see people kind of 
taking it that way um but it is that sequence when they go back to it is probably the most un- other than the fucking people being eaten by the alien yeah like probably even more uncomfortable because it feels more real right like in that moment of just watching this this ape and shout out to terry notary because like two two movies in a row now where he's kind of done a an a chimp performance in um this and he also was in the square doing that really uncomfortable scene where he acts like a chimp as well uh, right doesn't he yes, in, yep, in the him, square yeah. Yeah. yeah so um that guy and was he in the I think he was Apes in, movies yeah too? and I think he did like, work yeah. for for King Kong as well like so I just know a Andy great Circus ape actor yeah. <laughs> um but Terry no Terry and like um uh, I lost my train of thought but what was I going back to so um yeah just everyone in the cast and it never felt unbelievable to Kyle's point too of like everyone even though there's an alien creature like it felt true to all of these characters of kind of how they were acting i don't know like it it never felt like well they wouldn't fucking do this or like steven yun's character wouldn't do this or daniel kaluuya wouldn't act like that like it felt realistic in this world that they built of how each one of these characters acted throughout it and i liked their like the way that the movie set up too and and what it's saying is like you know their great 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 grandfather never really got credit for um he was you know the the actor on the horse in in the first ever kind of images put on film right yeah the first the, then, the, the, he was the, the, the edward moybridge yeah yeah the, i have yeah. it here um yeah so yeah edward um, moybridge is the horse in motion so yeah. they bring up that that was their great 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 grandfather and i great. think that's even interesting sorry an extra great um and i think that's interesting of their journey throughout the movie being like they want like they want to photograph this thing that's the basically thing and it brings in movie making in like a really fun way and hollywood in a really fun way and like um i love so going to michael wincott like him playing this cinematographer ant- antlers holst and like <laughs> him having this fucking hand crank imax camera is so funny to me and just like his his gravelly fucking uh, amazing performance is, is the purple per- people eater song, which is on the soundtrack. Eric, I know you'd be thrilled with that too. Um, it is, uh, he is fantastic as well. So he, he does um, so much with the, the only, like he's got a few scenes, but again, I love the little character details with all of these characters. Like, I love that he is all dressed in black, but he's wearing shorts and like that kind of pays off in almost like a comical tragic way when he gets killed. And I mean, there's a funny joke that Kyle and I were laughing our asses off when like, he just can't resist getting that, that impossible shot that he talks about a magic (laughs) hour where it's like, it's magic magic hour hour. (laughs) pulls out the camera and angels just like, what the fuck are you doing? And it's just like, it's Which amazing. is something a, a cinematographer would do, right? Like yeah. the yeah. fact that he looked at it and he goes, "Ooh, but now the sun's hitting the right spot. This is <laughs> this is going to be magical." Which is his line. Um, is just it's perfect. I and, and that's that's the thing is like every like cast member or every character has such a good at least one, but uh, such good character moments in the film. And but the and you and it yeah, you're so invested. And even even like that character kind of being introduced right off the start and then you come back to him, right? It's it, everything just, I, I love the construction of this film. It feels very concise, uh, yet it says a lot and does a lot. I, I want to also so say about the, the, um, the, the brother-sister relationship, what I love about OJ and Emerald is that you, like, even though, again, like that, there's not like this deep development that you maybe would find in an independent movie or like sure. something that's focused more so on like the relationship between siblings, but there's enough there that tells you a full story about almost this kind of estrangement between Emerald and, and her father. And that also her father and her are very similar personality wise. And that's probably why they butt heads. And that's also why she's not interested really, you know, in, in doing the whole ranch thing and wanting to break out and do her own thing. She's not interested in that. And so that kind of fell on Kaluuya, who was kind of brought up to kind of, you know, take over the ranch at some point. And like, there's this funny joke that again, like, you think like, oh, it's just a one-off line, but it has a weird payoff where, you know, Kaluuya's character says like, oh, the first gig that I ever went on was the Scorpion <laughs> King. And we, they yes. didn't even use horses, they use camels. But then it's like, okay, like you think it's just like a funny reference to a film that, you know, was one of The Rock's first leading roles. And then, you know, him, Daniel Kaluuya putting on 
the hoodie as if he's like this knight in shining armor and it has the scorpion king logo and the crew shirt on the background is an amazing kind of payoff to a joke that you think is like oh that's just like a one-off line but you look at that relationship between the two siblings and how you know like kyle mentioned it they they balance each other out perfectly in terms of that kind of introvert and extrovert but at the same time they always support each other when you know they need each other most and that pays off in a really powerful way in that final act and and even though keith david who i love to death and is another amazing voice two great voices in one movie isn't in it much you still feel his presence um, in that scorpion king hoodie (laughs) yeah in the house and in the in 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 the legacy and 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 i think peel is such a good director of actors like even though us isn't necessarily a great film i think lapita nyong'o is incredible in that yeah. movie winston duke is amazing in that i think movie. that whole cast in us is great yeah the he way that the most he, out of everybody yeah th- i mean i i love you know uh tim heidecker but what yeah. he does in that one sequence in us i would have never expected that from him and the way that he kind of plays like like he would have been an amazing silent movie actor especially like a, in a villain type role um is is incredible and here is the same thing like michael wincott's one of those guys who used to be ubiquitous in the 90s and into the early 2000s usually playing the villain and he hasn't like the last movie he was in he was had an uncredited role in ghost in the shell and then before that he was in terrence malick's knight of cups he was in a couple of episodes of westworld as old bill that he has a conversation with um anthony hopkins character in one scene and then uh, Jeremy Wright comes in and Jeremy Wright has worked with uh, uh, Michael Wincott before in uh, Basquiat, the Julian Schnabel film. So seeing him again, and also he he's from Scarborough. So it was just like wonderful seeing this character actor get a really solid role and doing something interesting, but also highlighting again, how incredible that voice is. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of CanCon in this, you know, we, we talk about uh, Corey Hart's sunglasses at night playing a really integral role, but even Gowan's Your Strange Animal, which never had any crossover success in the US. Like it, it, it just didn't. So it makes I feel me like this wonder. is the second time you brought up Gowan recently. Was well, it on uh, something else? I'm sure, I'm know. sure it is, but I'm also gonna mention with Keith David, like I want more Keith David in the way that like I loved how he was used in the nice guys. And I know we've brought up the nice guys now three times with our last three reviews with Nope and Thor, Love and Thunder and the and, and the Gray Man and now this. But yeah, it, it, Gow, that that was the only time I don't like to talk to other people while I'm watching a movie, but that was the only time where I literally went over to Kyle and said, it was fucking Gowan. <laughs> um, I, also, to I, answer your question about Gowan, Matt, uh, Eric has to hit a quota of three Gowan mentions a month. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yeah. He's been, he's been I know, doing it for his entire life. I swear to God, and they popped up in another, like one of their songs popped up in another movie recently. Oh, him, Lawrence Gowan. Um, no, but he, he well, his sure. stuff has, his stuff I has it. Well, I don't know who he is. He's one man, Matt. He's one man. <laughs> I thought it was a, ba- a band called Gowan. No, he, he but. was, he did, um, come in and sub for the lead singer of Sticks for a while, or he replaced the okay. lead singer of Sticks. But Lawrence Gowan, um was always sir lawrence gowan sir yeah sir lawrence gowan was always like a staple of ontario can con in the 1980s okay. uh criminal mind is probably his most notable song but like yeah there's nobody in the in the cast and crew other than michael wincott that's canadian that i just don't know how this happened and yeah I the want Corey hart know. thing really caught me off guard too because like uh, that I connected with, but um, but it's Gowan, but Corey Hart. No I, I, I love how it's used because it's not just simply a cover. But that also made me wonder about how that song is playing in the movie because is it on a CD and the CD shut off in Angel's car or it like because like why would it come back on if it was on the radio and it was it was I don't down? think it's on the it's not on the radio he, he, he was on he his had like, it, yeah his iPod or whatever it was either that or it was yeah on a like it was a it, disc, it, whatever a it was it was like by Angel's choice that right. had it in there yeah I think there was, was like, this a it was was this a period piece doesn't someone use a flip phone at one point that's a good question because um, I don't think there's a smartphone in this is there and same with Fry's Electronics I'm like it I looked a little I can't 
I'm like, maybe. I, I I guess no, I don't think anyone uses a smartphone. Well does well doesn't doesn't like... Angel have like a like a pad or something when they're outside kind of doing the yeah, that uh, could have just been like a... systems? Yeah. For the camera systems. Can... That's but true. but no, to your point, it is funny though, because if it if if the tech guy is still using a CD player in his car, that would be funny as well. That's what I was thinking the whole time. It's like, okay, so why is this song coming back and it's now been basically just like it's it's been slowed down. It has to be something coming from him and it's not on the radio then. And that's weirdly amusing. Yeah. This is why I mean, we need to rewatch it, you know? Yeah, I'm down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing, uh, the TMZ guy showing up was really The true villain and, of the like, film. <laughs> and, and really oh, yeah. well designed and unsettling. And like really, again, that's the shit that reminds, like shooting that in IMAX, this TMZ guy coming up in this fucking cool ass motorcycle helmet and stuff. I'm like, this is a cool ass movie, man. To kind of um, uh, jump off of earlier what you were talking about with the IMAX film and the decision to show yeah. the Gordy stuff in it, I think I, I really loved the discipline of um, Jordan Peele and and it was it was Hoyt, right? Hoyt, the, yeah. was the, Hoyt yeah, Van Hoytema, the Hoyt Dutch Van Swedish Hoytema. cinematographer. If of you're shooting right an IMAX, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean he's he's the best. But um, the discipline that they showed in those scenes of like having it so purely POV with the coverage. Um, Cause it paid off. Right. And again, yeah. like having that in IMAX, you're under the table. All of it is just, again, you're panning left and right. You're just on an unlocked tripod, just, you know, moving around looking. Right. So uh, that to me made it feel more engrossing when it's shot mm-hmm. in IMAX and you're not moving the camera. Like when Gordy chases down the, the, the father on the show and kills him, yeah. we don't follow. Right. And I think like all of those decisions uh, with, it was just a new way of implementing the IMAX, yeah, uh, film instead of it being about you know some grandiose scene, it was almost about just really putting you in a POV, which I thought yeah. was uh, incredible. Yeah. You feel and helpless sim- in that scene. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I was, was like very... anxious during that scene. Oh, so was I. Oh, was because you knew it was coming. Too, yeah, yeah, you knew yeah. what was coming because of the opening, right? Well, especially right. even the um uh the girl who plays the daughter who comes back in that one. Right. You feel so bad for that person yeah. because what a yeah. horrible life, you know, to be horribly mauled by this you know animal that's probably been abused and then to be eaten by jean jacket and then probably digested over the course of two days um is ridiculous but then yeah when you're watching that scene you're thinking to yourself like okay this is truly some of the most unsettling stuff of the film and when you're watching it like the first time and seeing that opening scene you have to think to yourself okay there's a reason why this is here. There's a reason why Peel is giving us this first. And then it's like, are you looking too deep for something more? You know, are, do you want something that is that didactic? Or do I you thought want... they were going to go Planet of the Apes where the aliens were monkeys, but right. <laughs> but, just... but, but even, even with the kids in the suits, like, uh, like that is like, okay, is the payoff going to be that they do kind of look yeah. like that later on the aliens. Yeah. But I think that that choice Those... was interesting as well. Cause yeah. that scene, is so funny but so creepy the way that they yeah. move and the like way the way the that it comes up from the ground oh and like the God. first reveal yeah. of like the alien is like is so great and i was gonna bring that up too because like, that's I a theater you know, moment too right uh, like it that's is a, a theater great. moment right yeah. Yeah. yeah where you hear people screaming that you get <laughs> punches scared into the face because you don't notice it at first right it's shot so well that you're just sitting there and you just see this thing and it's like the way that their costumes look are perfect Mm -hmm. because you just see the outline, like to Kyle's point earlier of like the eyes and the shape of the face. And then you just go, Oh, this is going to be some, some signs alien thing. And then like all those moments, which are great trailer moments, I think is so interesting because I think movie marketing is always fascinating and not wanting to give too much away in a movie and, and, and especially nowadays, but, um, all of those things, I wonder if it's like if they're written as like this will throw people off and I can throw these in the trailer because even the woman who, you know, that shot in the trailer, you think that that's, you know, you don't have the context until you see the movie. So all of these unsettling images um, with the even the fist bump from. Yeah, I was going to say under, even that looked shot, like an yeah. alien hand yeah. almost or something. Right. Yeah. Like, I think that's all super interesting. And it actually made me even enjoy it more seeing it in the theater because I'm like. Oh, I that's not what I expected that scene to be at all. <laughs> like yeah, contextualized and it, I, it was completely yeah. different the way everything yeah. played out. Yeah. Yeah, and even as the creature itself to bring everything full circle is just like it mm-hmm. really I was just like, "Oh shit, this is like a kaiju movie. It's like a like an adventure sci-fi monster movie." And I'm like, "Huh. 
Uh, I'm like, I did not expect that at all from this movie. And it, I think just skyrocketed my enjoyment out of it, even from the score too. Like um, I would say like throughout it, it, it has that vibe of that kind of Spielbergian kind of John, John Williams, Williams kind jaunty of, kind yeah. of score where it's like, yeah. it feels like it's like, I mean, if they had called this movie Sky Jaws, it would be giving it too much <laughs> yeah. away. But, <laughs> yeah. but at the same time, like it kind of has that sea bearing kind of adventure thing. Like I felt like there were moments where it's like, oh, this is when like, you know, Brody, Quint and Hooper are on yeah. the Orca and they're kind of like hanging out. And, you know, the plan that these characters come up with isn't like, you know, to necessarily trap the key- creature. It's to get photographic proof and the way that things kind of work out and the way that they don't again the payoffs are so satisfying but also feel somewhat more attuned to who these characters are you know they're not going to necessarily you know kill the thing or they're not necessarily going to catch it it's just like okay we did what we set out to do even though it didn't go as to plan and and i feel like maybe that's something as well where some people might not be satisfied with it where it's like oh well the creature got away well it's like well it does wasn't necessarily the point to really you know capture anything other than its photo which i love how that pays off as well again the well no, yeah there's no wasted if you see something in this movie and it's highlighted it's going to do something like there, yeah. there's, there's everything no is Chekhov's gun in this. In this. I was going to say, yeah, and usually yeah. I hate, I usually I hate that kind of stuff, I, but it was, unless it's done well, which it's done very well done here, very where like, well here. where like a lot of the times I can see that shit coming from a mile away and it just bugs the shit out of me. I just find it kind of like lazy and just kind of like, Oh, okay. Got to show me the thing and going to pop up later. Great. Okay. Fantastic. It did. But this, like in every instance of it, I'm like, Oh, Okay, that was a clever way of bringing that back that I yep. wasn't really either expecting or even if I was expecting it, it was like utilized well where, you know, you get all those moments where you're like, all right, I know that's going to come back later, but it's just how that comes back later. And it doesn't do that kind of like really, it treats its audience with respect almost um, too much at times where you could be confused at what's happening, whether it's the Gordy stuff or just like not overly explaining what the alien creature is or anything like that. Like it almost just goes, it is what you want, want it to be. But like, it doesn't do that. Like what I hate is just like, okay, let's linger on this thing for a while because I got to tell you, like you're a moron and I got to really kind of show you that this is going to come back later. So let's linger on this for a good five seconds and like do a slow zoom into it and i'm like thank god it's just like oh okay that item that item oh she saw the kids taking the crank photo Uh, but it doesn't just like it just seems like a moment where she's just being her character and it kind of moves on and then like how that comes back i think is great um and does do they kill the creature or not because yeah yeah, i thought it 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 got away no no, it 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 blows up remember the balloon okay. blows it up. Because I honestly kinda... thought like it just scared it and it moved on. And it was almost like in a way like it could continue with that thing going somewhere else. But I, I didn't see that's mm. one thing I wasn't completely sure with. And the other thing I will say that maybe this is a negative towards it. I wasn't I, I knew that like Daniel Kaluuya's character was sort of sacrificing himself or distracting, you know, Jean, Jean Jacket so um, the uh, motorcycle, the electric motorcycle could start up and, and Kiki Palmer's Emerald M could get away. But I wasn't sure if there was a moment where it kind of really emphasized the fact that like it was almost, it, it almost got him. Where like the payoff moment at the end where you have the hero moment where he's on the horse is a great scene. Like that's also a great crowd moment where like yeah. you see him and it's like that classic kind of Western, you know, after the showdown, the last, you know, man and woman standing are there and they've made it through this horrible ordeal, but I wasn't really sure with some of that, how it played beforehand. Um, But again, like talking to you guys about it, I'm glad that like you cleared that up because again, I wasn't sure. I thought it honestly got away because I wasn't sure what that plan was, if it were to kill it or not. Yeah, I think the balloon explodes inside. It gets like tank because they learn that it. Uh, he tries it to digest, or it tries to yeah. digest the giant inflatable cowboy with the one eye open, which I loved as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I, I, it explodes inside of it. I think, which I assume which... blowed it up. It looked pretty dead. It looked like a dead jellyfish in midair. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Like floating yeah. to the ground, and then all the news come, and then she has the proof in the in the photos. Yeah, Who's yeah, gonna clean this up? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. The other thing that like, and again, I, I'm curious with a rewatch because I know we were talking about it and we're like, you know, this is less, 
um, you know, the social commentary in it less evident uh, or mm -hmm. apparent as something like a Get Out or Us. Um, but I actually wonder with this movie, and I think I, I would almost love to talk to you guys. Uh, we don't have to record it, but we can just talk uh, <laughs> after we've all seen it again. Because I think like, you know, the themes of uh, animal exploitation, um, exploitation in general. Yeah. Like, I, I love the whole um, commentary that uh, OJ has about, you know, um, when he's talking about going back when they're in that restaurant and they're talking about going back and he's talking about, yeah, but who's really like profited from uh, all of these things. And, and you, you talk about like, again, like cultural appropriation and all of this and the idea of in Hollywood, it's like um, who's profiting off of these, uh, you know, when people start to exploit animals when people start to exploit different um, cultures and societies. Cultures, and it's just yeah, like, yeah. and it's just like, to me, there was so much, there were so many layers to this film in terms of uh, you could access this film purely on a surface level blockbuster, yep. have a good time, which I think the initial viewing, you're going to get most of that. Um, but I am curious to see how much you get after that uh, initial viewing of all the really good stuff that Peel's put in uh, underneath. Because I think, again, that's what he did really well with Get Out and what he did well with us and what I think he's honestly maybe even done... Um, most impressively with this because you, I don't think it's at the forefront or, or at least for the three of us, it wasn't at the forefront um, in comparison to the spectacle of it all. So anyways, yeah, I, I would be, I would love to talk to you guys after we've all seen it. There, again, there is one moment that I, I don't know if it necessarily fits in with, with, with that necessarily, but I did think it was interesting or telling of how the industry or Hollywood or commercials in general or production in general can be apathetic where you have that scene where Daniel Kaluuya, you know, is, is doing that one commercial the first time without his father six months later. And, you know, it's kind of comical because you have the rest of the crew, the director, the stage manager, um, the producers kind of like, is the horse ready? Is the horse ready to go? And then Osgood um, uh, Perkins and then Eddie uh, Jemison um, from the Steven Soderbergh Ocean movies are having this conversation where it's like, well, where's the other guy? It's like, oh, well, he just died. This is his son. And it's like, <sighs> what an inconvenience. Yeah, it's, and instead yeah. of, yeah, instead of yeah, saying yeah, like, oh, yeah. I'm sorry for your, for your loss. Like even just like the most basic, yeah. like, oh, that that's awful. It's like, well, what, a, what an incon, this guy is slowing things down. I wish the other guy was here, but he's dead. You know, like that kind of feels like a very kind of pointed sort of critique of okay. how uncaring and unsympathetic, uh, Hollywood productions or just filmmaking in general can be when like, it's like, well, you're just holding us up. It's not like, Oh, you're thinking about the other person who's like trying to figure this out, but doesn't have that person. And, and especially when you lose a parent, you know, like there's also something to be said as well. And maybe this is reading too much into it, but like, you know, there is that moment where you see the close up of the coin, the American coin in God, we trust kills. Yeah. That kills Keith David's character. And it's like, to me, I'm like, I, there's something to the messaging even there of like, you know, his father being killed by a form of American currency. I, I don't know. It's just maybe again, reaching, but I, I think there's like, there's such a good subtext woven into this film um, that's saying a lot without um, it I, getting yeah. in the way of the story. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, no. it's not as didactic as you would think it would be. It, it, it is more of an entertainment first and foremost, but there's a lot to parse through. Yeah. Which totally. is awesome. Sorry, Matt. I didn't. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just thought that that was no. Kind of I think that's great. I absolutely agree with everything you guys are saying, and um, I, I actually can't wait to see it again. So um, it's fun talking I, about it too. Like yeah. it's like I think it's one of those movies that's not only fun to watch with an audience. Like it's Kyle made this point. It is so good that if you have people talking next to you through the whole film it <laughs> oh still doesn't ruin you'll the still experience. you'll still enjoy it yeah, I, yeah. no i mean i don't recommend that though no I, no yeah, i know no I mean, yeah. I, but yeah. i was i was i was sat next to somebody who uh thought that they were hired to show up on our screening day and do a commentary for the film um it always and happens it was man. it was awful it was and it was like i can usually put up with that stuff it was just it was the worst it was it was really bad it was that somebody who doesn't know how not to have attention on them I uh, wouldn't have been able to do that. I, yeah. uh, I've gotten better because I don't like confrontation. And I try to just like after the pandemic, I was like, and that one time Eric and I got yelled at uh, and homophobic slurs yelled at us for okay. escape room guy. too. 
Like, yeah, I was just like, I'm trying to like, no, I think people should be put in their place sometimes, or at least politely told not to do something for the, it was. You know, yeah. It, I think there's a balance. I also like with a movie like this, the theater's so rambunctious and almost should be yeah. that it's yeah. a line where like, I didn't want to be, cause I enjoyed that element of it. It was just the that one, might, the one yeah. person next to me I know. wasn't like enjoying moments. It was like, I want the attention on me, even though we are all here to face this way and look yes. at a screen. <laughs> yeah. And it was just been, that that type of personality is is a bit different. But uh, been there definitely. Uh, yeah. The other thing too, like yeah, this is a movie, Eric. That it reminds me of like again, and one of those classic '80s or '90s movies we would throw on, and because we like Tremors, you know, man, Tremors, Tremors, like a small town monster movie kind of thing of like you know something you want to show. You know, it's because it has an edge to it and it's R rated. Maybe you don't show it to a kid or something, but it does remind me of one of those movies I would have watched as a kid too. That like was too adult for me or like or it reminds me of a movie that i watched then that i'm like oh now they're making like a r-rated version of that and and some of those movies had an edge too um back in the day too maybe they weren't like full-on r-rated like this no but one, jaws but, jaws has um, scenes in it that are like if you watch it as a kid are traumatic like the yeah. scene where you have richard dreyfus diving under the that shipwreck and finding the the head after he pulls out the giant shark tooth or even when quint dies robert shaw's character gets bitten Spoilers, and he spits wow. out blood um is i mean for a film that was released in 1975 that is kind of one of the most iconic films of all time being re-released so, in imax good segue I, yeah and i um, mean like both universal films as well um yeah it's it, so it's it yeah it, it's one of those movies where like i think it actually is like if you're if you have a teenager that maybe is like, say like 13, 14 and yeah. you, like, I mean, they probably have seen stuff already. Worse, like, let's yeah, just be they've honest. seen way worse. <laughs> but if, if they haven't, I would say that Nope is probably a really good kind of like starter R horror movie where it's not too hard, but it still has, as you mentioned that edge and like what Kyle was talking about, you know, for the most part, like this whole movie is a single location with the exception of the Gordy stuff. And I think that that never really entered my mind until afterwards mm -hmm. because he uses the landscape so well. And it feels like it's never like, it, like we talk about like, Oh, it's always good to have multiple locations because it changes things up and you're never stuck in one sort of backdrop. But this still feels like Southern California, that like this one sort of deserty kind of locale feels varied enough in sort of yeah. the but the geography is well used like you understand where everything well, jupiter's is. claim too we never talked about like that like the production design on jupiter's claim where Stephen young runs this like kind of like uh you know western alien park basically yeah. like um I wax think is like poetically really, about chris Catan. Yeah. oh my god yeah we didn't bring that up either. and Probably that's telling too of the character yeah. that he can't even face that moment that he has to live through it through a parody you through know snl yeah. yeah anyways it's great uh i hope can, can you i have give one our... more show to... yeah please yeah yeah yeah. uh because we didn't we touched on it but we didn't give it enough the other thing in this film that deserves a ton of credit beautifully shot amazing performances beautifully directed great production design the sound design in this film yeah is bar none just incredible yeah. and it, it does a ton a ton for this film and i think it's like a master class in good sound design yeah. yeah chris nolan take note jordan peele took note from you for imax so yeah you can hear everybody talking which is yeah. nice i i think um, yeah and top gun this year again like going back to top gun maverick top gun maverick and nope are two movies that understand how to make a really thrilling roller coaster ride but constructed in a way that is both entertaining but there's something more to it like you can get enjoyment out of it but there's something where like kyle you've seen top gun maverick now three times yep. and like it's one and matt and i've I have seen, seen it twice tw once in 40x yeah and i've so. and i've seen it twice so like it says something even like though that it's i don't think top gun maverick is maybe as rich subtextually as no but, no, no but there's something about how well that it's constructed both in sort of its action set pieces and in its storytelling that peel does the same way where like you know us has some really really good moments some really great constructed pieces but as a story as a whole it doesn't really stick the landing 
And with Nope, it feels like those set pieces and the story thread throughout work beautifully. And yeah, it's just, it's like very, two very great summer blockbusters. With very different messages about the sky. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're both sky movies. Yeah, if Danger true. Zone started playing in Nope, that would be pretty good. <laughs> um, Jaws is coming to IMAX soon. There was an Oppenheimer trailer with Nope, which uh, we did not get to see. Nope. Uh, Leaked before. on TikTok, though. I've already watched it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'll just, this is the weekend of shitty cam versions of trailers because it's also Comic Con weekend uh, and different things like and that. And Spielberg's so, The Fableman's um, playing at TIFF. Yeah. So we'll be talking about universal. all of that uh, on the next uh, episode of the Untitled Movie Podcast. Uh, the Oppenheimer trailer was uh, very much a Nolan trailer, but uh, it reminded me of that Dark Knight teaser because of the just the fire taking up the entire frame and then a just voiceover voiceovers from, yeah. yeah which is basically what this was but some uh, men just want to see the world burn that's basically what this teaser was it's like the real joker was the guy who created the nuclear bomb yeah all right everyone uh thank you for listening or watching we really uh do appreciate it like eric mentioned we'll be talking about comic-con uh tiff spielberg's coming to tiff uh, Vince McMahon retired. Maybe I'll talk about that. That's wild. We might need Kyle to come back to talk some no, I, at some point. I'll save your uh, <laughs> listeners from coming yeah. out again for a while. They had to deal with no. my rambling on this one. Dude, you're talking to the kings of rambling. That's, that's true, actually. Well, I, yeah. I talk to your brother every week, and we go two plus hours, two and a half hours on a regular I, I know all of your deepest thoughts um, about Coke flavors and Taco yeah, Bell menu items. So. Just yeah. And Kyle, you today. actually brought some insight and, and some thoughtful perspectives to this movie that i don't think matt and i have so you know like you're welcome back anytime speak for yourself all right you piece of shit (laughs) speak for yourself i was actually just Uh, speaking more so about matt (laughs) um uh go check out all of our stuff over on letterboxd which is at untitled underscore cast um and as always my name is matt rohrbeck you can find more of my work around the internet uh mostly at untitledmoviepodcast.com family feud is premiering not soon in September, so I'll plug that closer. But all my are your questions going year. to start circling in September? Yeah. yeah. So five days a week, Family Feud Canada will be on. I don't know how many of my questions will actually make the show, but I'm wrapping up uh, that in the next month or so, and then we're leading right into tips. So uh, at Matt Rohrbeck on all those social medias. And I'm Eric Marchin. You can find more of my video reviews on rogerstv.com slash cinemascene, including Nope and uh, Fire uh, of Love. Uh, and you can follow me on all the social medias uh, at EM6211. Kyle, anything you want to plug? Do you want people to follow you anywhere? Or do you just yeah, want people to leave you sure. alone? Yeah, you can. I mean, <laughs> solitude is nice. Um, yeah, you can follow me. Um, I'm on Instagram uh, at kmarchin. Uh, I wouldn't follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's not worth it. Um, Fair. It's more just for me. <laughs> it's more just for me, you know. Uh, yeah. And then um, Letterboxd. Yeah, same tag, at K Merchant, if you want a very chaotic feed. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Uh, until next time. Would you look at that? I made my Gowan quota three this month. Bye, everyone.